welcome to the EdTech God Pod, your window into the world of advertising technology and the people behind it. I'm your host, EdTech God. Welcome to today's episode of the EdTech God Pod, where we chat with some of the top marketing executives in our industry. Today's guest is Leslie Lee, the Senior Vice President of Marketing at Vistar Media. Leslie has been with Vistar for over seven and a half years, demonstrating her dedication and success by progressing from Director of Marketing to her current role as Senior VP. This highlights her contribution to Vistar's marketing efforts and her dedication to their success. Before joining Vistar, Leslie worked at ChoiceStream, Turn, and Inghouse, a PR agency. One of the most fascinating aspects of meeting new guests weekly is learning about their longevity with their companies. And often it comes down to a positive company culture, opportunities for upward mobility, and commitment to education. I'm excited to meet Leslie today. Leslie, welcome to the AdTech Godpod. Hello, thank you for having me. Of course, thank you for being here and, and thank you for taking time out of your day to, you know, to chat today. Glad to. Leslie, I'm familiar with Vistar Media or Vistar, and I can't wait to dive into it because I've always been pretty fascinated with Out of Home. But before we go there, I'd, I'd love to hear about how you became a Senior VP of Marketing and how you got into the industry overall. I can start back. So I began my career in PR, working, as you mentioned, at an agency called Ink House out of the Boston area. And that's really actually how I sort of fell into ad tech. I, as the kind of lowest person on the employee roster, I got assigned to a bunch of accounts that at the time weren't that popular, which were all of these new companies talking about bidding strategies for advertising. So actually, my first accounts were some of the earlier ad tech companies. So companies like AdMeld, which went on to get sold to Google, Turn in the early days. So I really got started in PR trying to explain some of the early concepts like defining real-time bidding or kind of teaching people about this concept of a stock exchange for ads through PR and thought leadership. So it was sort of an accidental entry into the ad tech field. But then eventually, a couple years later, turn, my former client was hiring for an in-house PR position. So that's how I ended up making the move to New York and going in-house at turn there for several years, and then moving to a different, a smaller DSP, and then eventually joining Vistar Media about seven and a half years ago. Coming from the PR aspect of, of things, obviously you were involved kind of early on educating people about how online auctions work. And, you know, we compare it a lot to the stock exchange or, or stock market. How are you feeling that's similar to what you're doing today, I guess, with with out-of-home and digital out-of-home growing and and still needing some market education to its benefits? How do you feel that that's helped you? Yeah, there's a lot of similarities in that many people today, even who are very well-versed in ad tech and what's happening in advertising, are actually pretty unfamiliar with the capabilities that exist in out-of-home. I think people are starting to understand that programmatic out of home exists, but there's still a ton of awareness to build about just how deep the targeting and precision and and same automation benefits go into this more traditional channel. So it does sort of feel similar to the early days of just even explaining the core concepts. And now it's just that added twist of helping people understand how does this work when you're talking about a billboard out in the world rather than a banner ad on your browser. So there's a lot of actual similarities in just trying to tell people the story of what advertisers can actually do with these new capabilities. Yeah, I sense that the industry is in this weird phase today with with digital out of home. This is just my opinion. Like they see the value and they obviously see these billboards. Like there's no doubt that we've seen one or two or thousands of them out in the real world. I think it's it's measuring and understanding what those impacts are. We've seen it kind of in the digital out of home CTV conversation that we hear in market a lot. Are you finding that the marketers themselves are grasping the concept of a digital billboard and how those can be measured for their outcome for their campaigns? Yeah, I think they are understanding it more and more. And especially as the measurement capabilities themselves grow and we're able to tie out of home exposure to more different types of KPIs. So doing a foot traffic study is fairly common or a brand lift study, but more and more kind of building out that we can do actual sales lift or tie to online conversions. That's where I think there's 
a lot of education for people to even understand how that works on a technical level of tying exposure then back to one of these metrics. But I also think there's still a bit of a gap between sort of the awareness and love that marketers express for the channel of out of home and digital out of home, but then their confidence in actually putting the money in the channel. So that's definitely what we're working to bridge. Do you find that that would probably be like one of the biggest challenges you have is is helping them, I guess, understand the value and then follow it up with increasing spend or increasing investment into digital out of home and out of home? Yeah. Luckily, I think, you know, we have a pretty good track record of if we can get an advertiser and their agency partners to really do a strong test and actually invest at a level that allows us to do measurement, you know, we can tell a really good story and show great results. And we get a very good return rate on that of brands coming back. You know, sometimes it's a challenge of people are willing to to put a test budget in place, but it's not really enough to kind of get those measurable results. But I think in general, the biggest gap is really helping people shift how they think about out of home overall. A lot of times, you know, brands have dedicated out of home budget, but they're thinking about it as exclusively top of funnel, mass reach brand awareness, and they already have their programs laid out. So it's trying to help people shift you know, this could be part of your programmatic mix. You can think about it as more lower funnel campaigns. So that's kind of the biggest hurdle now is just helping people redefine where they put the channel of out of home overall in their media planning. So like digital out of home is obviously what this, I think it's the second fastest growing after connected TV. I think so. Yeah. Um, market. Yeah. I think it's connected TVs first and then digital out of home is second. What kind of keeps you in it? You've been there for so long. So seven and a half years is a long time to stay in one place. I'd love to hear why and how they've kept you around for so long. Cause it's, it's actually impressive. And I love hearing from my guests as to, you know, what keeps them there? What keeps them motivated every day? Yeah, I definitely didn't expect to be here this long. I think before I joined Vistar, honestly, I was sort of ready to ch- check out of ad tech in general as a marketer and PR person. I was just getting a little tired of writing about header bidding and waterfalls and click through rates. But the out of home aspect of it was so fascinating to me. It's such a different application of the tech. And, you know, it is real stuff in the real world that you could walk by and see. And living in New York, I mean, I love that I see the ads on the subway and the bus stops and, you know, back of the taxi cabs. So it's just a little bit more tangible. But, you know, Vistar specifically, I think is, obviously I'm biased, but a pretty special company to work at. It's been a great mix of people who are really hungry and have that startup energy, but don't necessarily have the Silicon Valley overarching, I don't know, race toward an exit. So we've been able to build the company in a very healthy way, which I think has kind of allowed us to focus on our clients, focus on the tech and innovating without needing to kind of take some of those less responsible moves that ad tech companies in the past have had to do. So, you know, I will say for me in my career, the rate that the company has been growing, I feel like every year and a half that I sort of feel like I reach a a plateau and have learned, you know, everything about my job, then suddenly there's some huge new opportunity to wrap my head around. So that just constant learning and growth is what keeps me here. Every time that you start to think you know exactly what you're doing in your job, there's some other huge curveball, which to me is what keeps keeps work fun. I know. I kind of I kind of like it, to be honest with you. I couldn't imagine just being in the same industry doing the same thing every year. The fact that I think ad tech in general and advertising is just changing constantly is fun. It's also a little bit intimidating because I, I feel at one point in my day, I feel like I know something. And then by like 5 p.m., 6 p.m., I go, oh, gosh, here's something else I don't know. So it's changing so fast that it, it really is hard to keep up. But it also keeps it interesting. Like, you know, you're never going to know everything about everything. It never really goes stale, which which is fun. Yeah, I think that's what makes it exciting. With with digital out of home specifically, it's changed a lot. I think it's growing rapidly. We're seeing spend in market kind of shift towards the digital out of home. There's obviously budgets being carved out, whether it's from traditional to non-traditional outdoor. 
where do you see things heading for digital out of home in particular and what trends are you seeing? One thing we're seeing, which is pretty exciting, is actually reaching the tipping point from programmatic out of home being treated, as I mentioned earlier, as a test budget into really pretty scaled out investment from brands. So we've reached a point now where we're seeing multiple brands spending upwards of $10 million a year in programmatic out of home. That's a big change. And, you know, that's still a small number, but there's a much larger number that are spending more than a million a year in programmatic out of home. So I think we're reaching that real proof point that this is a core part of a marketing strategy that can really deliver results to a brand. So that's exciting to see. But then with the out of home landscape overall, I mean, we're seeing further change just in the digital out of home inventory available. So there's a lot more available inside of retail spaces these days, and that's continuing to grow. There's some really exciting new media offerings in the marketplace with things like EV charging stations that have these big, beautiful screens right outside of a Whole Foods or you know other prime locations. So I think that's also an interesting trend where it's a marketplace where the quality of the inventory keeps increasing and the scale of the inventory keeps growing as well. So that it's nice to see the growth in that supply kind of going hand in hand with the growth from the demand investment. I remember digital home starting and now there's so much, well, there's such a variety of digital out of home, like so many different flavors. So like, you know, in vehicle, vehicle rooftop, just a standard billboard in Times Square or an airport. Now, what I think the in the airplanes now, the digital out of home, is it United that did that? They're the United Network. And so you look and you're like, okay, it's everywhere. We're catching consumers everywhere at every kind of point of their journey from, you know, hopping in their car and driving on a freeway or sitting in a train or in their elevator heading up to their office, that it actually creates quite a nice story for brands to be able to target your user throughout their their daily journey, I guess. Yeah, exactly. You're really reaching people in all sorts of contexts throughout their day. And, you know, I think for a brand too, it's one of the few media channels and advertising formats that is non interruptive. We're not preventing someone from doing the thing they want to do, which is, you know, an online video. They want to watch the video they want to watch. They don't really want to watch your ad. And, you know, in out of home, an ad is never going to pop up out of the sidewalk and stop you from walking down the street. But it's more seamlessly integrated into that experience. So I think it's also that kind of combination of, as you said, reaching people through all these different moments in their day when they might be participating in, you know, commerce or travel or whatever it is, but in a, in a manner that is a little bit more natural to actually how humans just walk through the day than a lot of media formats that we see day to day. Can I just say, I'd love it if that happened, if it just popped <laughs> out of the sidewalk or like, just wait a second, you got to watch this 30 second yeah. ad before you continue across the street. <laughs> that would be pretty awesome and annoying, but I'd love to see it happen. If you weren't working in in ad tech we we all have our hobbies and our passions is there is there something that you feel you'd be doing if you weren't working at vistar and not working in advertising or ad tech if money were no option then i would probably be trying to be a travel writer <laughs> i worked briefly when i was younger um for a few travel guides and had the privilege of being paid to explore the world so I think that's pretty much a dream job. Um, so that is probably what I would be trying to do. Do you do it now as a hobby at all? I do a little bit, but I don't really publish it anywhere. It's more just keeping, you know, keeping track of interesting things and yeah, trying to keep a record of the amazing places in the world. Do you happen to know um, Nola Solomon from Critio? I don't. So she's, she's great. She was a guest, um, I want to say a few months ago. She's also... She's an SVP, I think of like global market strategy, but she's like a big writer. Like that's her passion. And she does that regularly. And I think she published a book too, but that's kind of like her, her passion. So she works at Critio, works in tech, but then loves to write. And I think that's what she did just coming straight out of college and just never really stopped, which was pretty cool. Yeah. Amazing. We are going through weird phases in our industry. We've heard a lot of kind of layoffs over the last few years. It seems like it's cooled down now, but the job market is 
slowly rebounding. I'm hearing a lot more jobs popping up here and there. So it adds a lot of pressure for people to just provide for their families and provide for themselves. What do you think we need to do as, as an industry to kind of keep checking in our happiness and make sure that we're satisfied with what we do day to day? Yeah, I think it's a very critical skill for everyone to build into your own day to day, you know, work life. For me personally, it's kind of trying to carve time at least a few times during the week to take a breath and have some outlet that lets you put it in perspective. So whether that is just if you have kids spending time with them, I find that's a very good way to keep your priorities in check. Or just thinking about the world at large, if you live in a city, actually paying attention to all the people around you and realizing, you know, when you think about your own life, do you feel grateful for the things you have? And for most people, the answer is almost always yes. And if you ever reach a point where you're not able to access that level of gratitude, then then it's time to look around and think about where you're investing your time because we have very limited energy and time in this world. So if you're not able easily to access that level of gratitude, it's probably because you're spending your time on things that that you shouldn't be. So I think that's kind of at a deeper level. And, you know, day to day, just taking a breath, taking a walk, realizing it's really not, you know, it's really not that serious. We joke here that we're putting ads on screens at the end of the day. It's okay. You know, if something has to slip, it can slip. You know, we're delivering high quality work. We're proud of ourselves. But you know, this really just isn't that serious at the end of the day. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I feel like that's hard to, to live by. I've, I've been overwhelmed and stressed and, you know, felt like, oh my gosh, what's going on? This is scary times. This is good. This is not good. Happy, not happy. And it's like the typical waves that you go through, like, you know, great couple months, really bad month, great couple months. And I think that's what I always go back to is in the end, like, it's important we deliver for our clients. We keep our promises with partners. But in the end, it's just an ad. We're not heart surgeons. We're not curing some disease. We are literally serving ads. And, and the important part is we do it to the best that we can. And hopefully, you know, the clients stay and they, they keep spending with us and maybe spending more. But it's, it's not life-changing here, which is kind of nice. And it's fun sometimes. And it should be fun. You know, your work, sh you should find at least even in the day-to-day -day problems you're solving, I hopefully, ideally, something that you genuinely enjoy doing. If you're a spreadsheet person, that you're getting in the numbers. If you're a writer, that you enjoy that, you know, or at least some, some problem that you actually have fun solving. I mean, Leslie, who would have thought that I would have fun making memes and then have a <laughs> podcast? And then Ari Paparo calls me and says, I like you. I want to buy you. And I'm like, okay. I don't know what that means, but let's talk. <laughs> um, so it's been amazing being a part of architecture overall. Okay. So one question I have that's kind of off script, but we're kind of looping back into digital out of home just because I have a huge interest in it. It's just something I really like. So with connected TV in the early days, there was almost like no open exchange, meaning that a lot of the inventory you access was, was pretty much direct. There was no demand pumping through any sort of exchange. And then it started to build up as brands started to shift dollars. And then this open exchange started to kind of create more supply, more demand. And then we built it up. From my understanding, and I could be totally wrong, is, is that where digital out of home is today? Are you seeing enough spend from an open exchange or should digital out of home billboards or providers, suppliers have to strike those direct deals with DSPs and with brands? Yeah, it's it's sort of interesting with programmatic for out of home because it started with exclusively the open exchange. The concept of a PNP really didn't exist when Vistar started. Vistar kind of brought programmatic to the out of home marketplace and all we had was the open exchange. But at the time it was also a non-transparent exchange, so it wasn't ideal for advertisers because they didn't know exactly which publishers they were buying and that kind of led to the introduction of PMPs where they obviously had transparency as to the exact inventory they were purchasing. But where we're at today now, the exchange is the open auction or open exchange is fully transparent. So buyers know exactly what media owners they're getting. They can get the site list 
And we actually see a pretty healthy split of investment. So we do see a pretty high volume of spend on the open exchange. And to me, that really makes the most sense for an audience-driven strategy, particularly when you're thinking about the physical world. You're actually thinking about where people literally physically spend their time and finding the screens that exist within those locations. So letting the audience data dictate the purchase makes a lot of sense. And we see a ton of investment in that space. But we do have a a fairly sizable investment flowing through PMPs. A lot of that is for particularly high demand inventory, same as in any other channel. So, you know, if you think about things like Times Square, those are going to be run through PMP deals, which makes sense. There's a high commitment. You know, you need to lock in the inventory. And obviously, media owners like it. They get a little bit more control over the over the buy and, and direct negotiations. But, you know, the open exchange is growing pretty steadily. And with platforms like Vistar, we do see a good amount of spend flowing through the open exchange, as well as increasingly the spend that's coming from some of the omni-channel platforms. So the Trade Desk, DB360, Yahoo, et cetera, are all partners of Vistar. And, you know, they are also building up their investment on both the open exchange and PMP transaction types. Or the capabilities that you have, like day partying, obviously based on their geolocation, is that all dynamically done programmatically through an open exchange? Or if I wanted more targeting, like day partying or dynamic type of creative, does that all have to be kind of a direct deal? No, that can all be done programmatically through the open exchange. You can apply that to PMPs, but dynamic creative was probably the most recent change that previously could only be done through direct deals, but we have the tech now to basically allow any digital screen to support it so we can run dynamic creative through the open exchange as well. Awesome. Yeah. I don't know if you knew this, but I ran a bunch of billboards. So I ran them in New York at the Miami event for Possible. I had in-vehicle screens. So when you drove from the airport to the venue for Possible, my ad was there with the QR code to listen to a podcast. I did it in New York City on some of the billboards there. I did it in Palm Desert. I think it was a DigiDay event. I kind of troll events with my digital out of home campaigns. That was kind of my goal was where there are going to be a bunch of people that work in the industry and how can I reach them and kind of get the name out. So that's really how I started. I was was literally trolling every event, which was awesome because people would send me pictures like, oh, I saw your billboard. I'm like, awesome. All I need is one picture and I'm going to post it and say that I'm trolling. So it's fun. It was fun. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of Digital Out of Home personally, so I really appreciate you being here today and, and taking time out of your busy schedule. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Ad Tech God Pod, a podcast for the people about the people that make ad tech great. Stay connected with me for more insights, trends, and interviews in the realm of ad tech. Don't miss out on our latest updates. So follow me on X, Instagram, and connect with me on LinkedIn. Don't forget, ATG Slack community has insights, networking opportunities, and jobs. Keep the conversation going and stay at the forefront of ad tech innovation.